Good morning, everyone. My name is Chad Toprak, and I'm the director of Free Play. Welcome to day three of uh, the Free Play 2021 Festival. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Free Play hosts and broadcasts from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where stories have been shared and games have been played since time immemorial. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to anyone watching who has a connection to the world's oldest living culture. Sovereignty was never ceded and the violence of the colonial project is still ongoing. Um, the free play also stands in solidarity with the people of Palestine, where violations of human rights take place on a daily basis. As artists and game makers, we cannot afford to stay silent or apolitical against colonial violence, sy systematic oppression and apartheid. We urge our community to consider how political activism may play a fundamental role in the way we uh, uh, go about our creative practice and the way we express ourselves and our values through the art that we make. Um, if you haven't already, please check out the Indie Bundle for Palestinian Aid on itch.io. For as little as $5, you could contribute to something that makes a big difference and also have access to over a thousand games. 100% um, of the sales go to aid. So grab the bundle while you still can. There's only one day left. Um, joining us today is Rosela, um, speaking on game engines and uh, game engines in activist spatial experience. Um, Rosela Baslamet is a digital designer, an experimental artist, and an academic. She's lectured in uh, design, digital and interactive media in Australia and Jordan, and has exhibited several digital and video art projects, interactive installations worldwide. Rosella is the founder of Lab Tajribi Experimental Expressions and holds a PhD in design from Curtin University, Australia. Her interests are centered in design activism, social justice, and representations of the misrepresented. Um, please make Rosella feel welcome, and I'll hand it over to you, Rosella. Thank you, Chad. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, I'm really pleased to see that Free Play is standing with Palestine, and we really appreciate that. Um, thanks so much, Chad, and um, the rest of the team at uh, Free Play. Um, so let me start by sharing my presentation, so hopefully that is appearing all fine. So today I'll be talking to you about the use of game engines in activist spatial experiences. In particular, I'll be looking at a prototype that I have created to illustrate that, which is called Revisit Palestine. My presentation today is uh, based on my doctoral research, which uh, I finished from Curtin University in 2019 and which was funded by the Australian Government Research Training Program Scholarship. And um, I hope that my presentation today will not be too academic and um, it will be engaging for all of you. And probably I need to state uh, uh, from the start that I'm not a gamer and um, I don't consider myself a game developer. Uh, I've been using game technology and um, the medium of play in my research for quite some time now. But as I said, like I don't uh, consider myself a, a game developer per se. So uh, um, First and foremost, I want to acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you uh, from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge that Australia is, always was and always will be an Aboriginal land. And given my talk and the nature of the current situation in Palestine, I want to reiterate and express again uh, my solidarity with the people of Palestine, especially in the neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan in Jerusalem. And as always, my uh, solidarity with the people in Gaza who has been under a uh, brutal uh, blo blockade for around 14 years now. So I'm going to start by outlining uh, my presentation and what exactly are the key points that I will be uh, addressing. 
So I'll start by explaining what do I mean by activist spatial experiences. Um, then I'll explain why do we need activist spatial experiences. From there, I will uh, talk a little bit about the use of game engines beyond gaming and gamification. Then I'll um, talk in more details about the prototype that I have created as an activist spatial experience, which is Revisit Palestine. From that, I'll uh, start talking more about the potentials and the limitations of using game engines in activist spatial experiences. And finally, I'll conclude my uh, presentation and open up for uh, any questions or comments that you might have for me. So what is an activist spatial experience? This term is a term I came up with during my research to try and describe a new kind of exhibiting and exhibition that is created from an activist point of view. So these exhibitions are designed to be mobile, temporal, adaptable, and quite importantly, low cost, using low cost technology. The media that is used is usually interactive and immersive and engages the use of virtual environments to create um, experiential spaces that can be used or uh, exhibited as urban interventions or they could be seen in uh, mobile devices and applications or they can, uh, they can be presented as exhibitions in art galleries and museum spaces. These activist spatial experience are adding to the investigation of possible media exposure for political narratives that have been contested, overshadowed, neglected, silenced, or silenced by better resource narratives. So these experiences are activist in the way that they com are communicating political narratives and counter narratives uh, to the main uh, stream narratives uh, to raise awareness about that particular political situation. And um, usually um, they focus on uh, underrepresented uh, narratives, especially in the Western context. And activism implies being rooted with uh, on the ground movements and real people sharing their lived experience. And I'll talk more about that later when uh, I show you uh, my prototype. So why do we need activist spatial experience? Um, the main um, drive for me was a term coined by Edward Said, the famous Palestinian um, intellectual, which is permission to narrate. And that's really important, especially for people who are usually silenced or ignored. And that happens specifically to the Palestinian people where their voices have been uh, not considered as credible as uh, um, other uh, voices, especially when talking about the history of the, uh, of the situation and the, um, all the current um, events that unfolds. So usually political narratives and political events have been represented in museum spaces and in memorial spaces. Um, think um, like the Holocaust museums, the Upper Time Museums, or the war memorials. And usually these spaces are created with large funds. They have the support of the government or the support of like large funding bodies. But if we're talking about ongoing conflicts or political situations where people uh, are are disfranchised or they, are, they don't have the means uh, or the, uh, the means to have such uh, large funding. Uh, so what could, be, um, what could be an alternative for them? And that's why I thought, well, maybe using interactive media and digital media could be a solution to create those temporal and mobile spaces that don't actually need any real um, building of spaces. And, um, that is quite important um, in, the, in, in terms that these conflicts and these situations are ongoing, which means that there's always events happening and unfolding. It's not like something that we can just sit and reflect on. It's actually something that is happening and changing. So having this, um, knee, uh, like this flexibility and this um, ability to update uh, regularly is something uh, that is quite powerful in interactive uh, and digital media. Um, and yeah, 
So that's why I uh, decided to use game engines. And game engines are built to create three-dimensional interactivity. And this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to create virtual spaces where people can start to experience uh, uh, and understand the, the political situation or the conflict that um, I was presenting. And now game engines have been used beyond gaming and gamification for a long time. So you have many terms that came up um, to, um, to explain that. So you have serious games or game-based learning, playful learning, gamification, edutainment, or there is a phrase um, called persuasive games, which has been coined by Ian Bogost, and it's the name of his um, uh, company now. And um, all of these terms um, um, simply denotes that these are digital or non-digital games that are used for more than just entertainment purposes. So they could be educational, they could be uh, for social purposes, uh, and so on and so forth. But between all of these um, uh, terms, the, the concept or uh, the main important thing that, that is the playfulness or the gaming is still, or the game, uh, the gameplay is still there. So when I was looking more about, well, what exactly um, the experience that I'm creating uh, would, like, where would it sit between all these different terms? And then I found a continuum of ser serious um, games, which has been uh, explained by Tim Marsh. And in his continuum uh, for serious games, he starts uh, with um, at one end with serious games um, as games for purpose, which is um, quite clearly is just a game. But it has, um, uh, so it has all the traditional characteristics, characteristics sorry, of gaming, of games, but it um, have a specific purpose other than entertainment. Moving from that, the second group that he suggested is uh, serious games with reduced gaming characteristics. So here you have games or environments that do still have uh, and retain some of the gaming characteristics, but they shift away from games into environments and digital media with purposes as well. And then at the end of his continuum, you have serious experiential and cultural purposes. And in this third group, the purpose of these uh, environments is to provide um, experiences and emotions that facilitate Mean, uh, meaning making for their users. So these are the ones, uh, the environments and the media that have the least or almost no gaming uh, characteristics. And I felt that what I'm trying to do sits within that part of the continuum. And um, that's when I decided to call it the activist spatial experience. And again, the focus for me was on using that term activist. Uh, activist. So this is part of also um, adding into the design uh, activism uh, discipline. So the prototype that I have created, Revisit Palestine, which you have been seeing parts, um, images of, the, um, of it being presented, is an interactive installation that um, has a real-time virtual environment and the user could move uh, in, in, inside that environment. And um, it was all wall video projections and it was controlled um, using leap motion controller, which is an infrared sensor. And um, um, using the leap motion was um, a, con a conscious decision to move uh, away from the normal or expected gaming um, input devices. So like the joystick or uh, the Wii or any other kind of um, controllers, gaming controllers. Um, and Revisit Palestine was aimed at the Western audience who have limited understanding of the Palestinian situation, which meant that in the narrative, I had to focus on giving some bit of history and context for that, um, uh, for, uh, for the Palestinian situation. And um, it aimed at raising awareness by introducing counter narratives. So some of the stories shared were not uh, familiar to the audience and um, um, uh, they were uh, people, everyday people sharing their, um, their narratives. 
Um, this is a, a layout of the, um, uh, of the experience. So in the middle, uh, you had, uh, which was the main projection, you had the virtual environment and it was built using Unity game engine. And um, the viewer would see themselves as first person controller inside that environment. So they can move forward, backward, look in all directions. Uh, their movement was controlled by a leap motion controller, which sat in the middle of the space or on a plinth. And then uh, the two uh, other projections on either sides were videos. And these videos would play at certain points in the viewer's movement inside the virtual environment. Uh, and these videos were all uh, videos created by Palestinians in the ground. Um, so um, they all were sharing personal stories and vivid experiences. And uh, they were almost um, all uh, done by Palestinians. And um, also in the main environment, at some points, uh, there would be certain triggers that would trigger some text information that would overlap the, the virtual environment before the uh, viewer can move uh, um, forward. The narrative uh, that I've used for this prototype used the typical gaming uh, standard narrative, which consist of three main uh, scenes or three main points, the exposition, the conflict, and the resolution. Um, so for that, I've, you, uh, I've tried to pick uh, three cities to reflect that. So the first scene starts in uh, Jaffa, Jaffa uh, and that's where we lay the foundation of um, our narrative of the Palestinian situation. So talking about the history, the pre-1948, and then um, uh, 1948 Nakba and the creation of uh, the State of Israel and also the, um, the, uh, the creation of the Palestinian uh, refugees. From there we jump in time and space to Jerusalem uh, in the second scene and that where we talk about the main uh, uh, the main manifestations of being under military occupation and being uh, under uh, apartheid policies being imposed on you. So um, this scene focuses on the ID card system that is imposed by Israeli um, government. And then we talk about the separation wall, the checkpoints, the restriction of movements of Palestinians. And Jerusalem sits in the heart of that because who can enter or who can leave Jerusalem is um, is quite um, shows um, the extent of the apartheid uh, policies of Israel against Palestinians. And from Jerusalem, we uh, go to Gaza, uh, um, a trip that is uh, quite impossible to do in reality, unfortunately. So in Gaza, uh, we focus uh, on the siege or the blockade, which uh, Gazans have been uh, enduring for the past 14 years. Um, I also talk about the several um, military operations that have been done uh, on them. And um, then you reach the end of this experience, which you feel uh, which the viewer find themselves trapped, unable to move forward or backward. And um, that's the no resolution. That's the uh, ugly um, reality of Palestinians and uh, their current situation, especially those in Gaza. Um, the viewer in this narrative is a first person, uh, as I said, like a first person controller. So uh, they they can do all the things that uh, normally is done in uh, gaming settings, like moving, looking around, um, uh, and to help them navigate um, this um, experience, I introduces uh, sorry, I introduced a guide, and the guide for their experience was Handala, and Handala is a cartoon uh, created by Naji Al Ali, who's a Palestinian uh, cartoonist who got assassinated while walking the streets of London. So Handala was created to represent um, Palestinian refugees. Uh, he's a 10 year old boy. And um, when Naji Al Ali created him, he created him actually to represent himself because when Naji Al Ali uh, became a refugee, he was 10 years old. 
And Handallah since then have become a symbol for the Palestinian endurance and persistence and resistance. Um, so um, using him uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this experience posed um, quite um, a challenge because um, I tried creating a 3D version of Handallah, but it just it didn't feel, feel right to me. And then I decided to actually use Handallah in his original format as done and as created by Naji. And if you look at the environment, Handallah sits quite um, out of, um, like he, he doesn't sit comfortably there. And I think um, that adds to the whole experience of Handala being actually a refugee. So as a refugee, he's not actually allowed to go and see all of these places where he's guiding us through. So um, it, it adds to the surreal <coughs> nature of this, um, of this virtual journey through Palestine. And as I've explained uh, before, the um, controller that, I, that I've decided to use was a leap motion controller. And um, the reason is you can hide it. It doesn't look like it's a game controller. The technology is hidden. And it's something that was quite, um, as I said, a conscious decision for me. I did not want uh, people to be um, attracted by the novelty of the technology and rather focus on the subject that is being presented to them. I've custom designed and built a plinth where um, the leap motion sat uh, like flush to a black surface. So people did not even, like there were some people who did not even know that the, um, the part that is reading their hand movement is only that small uh, rectangle. Uh, so these are some uh, more images from the um, um, from the installation. So as I said, when we were mo moving inside the virtual environment, there were videos that I have curated from online sources, and um, these videos um, the, um, could be updated like later on, depending on you know the um, what new events happen. So for example, if you look at um, <clears throat> the video projected on the walls at this moment, and maybe some of you who have been watching the news could um, actually recognize that this is the house of these two uh, young uh, twin. And um, the video that they took, they took uh, when they were 10 years old. And now, they are Buna and Muhammad al Kurd, who have been famous in the last month or so for uh, speaking up and for raising awareness about the situation in Sheikh Jarrah, where um, families are being forcibly, uh, like Israel is trying to forcibly remove uh, families from their uh, from their homes, and so um, it's it's really. Um, heartbreaking to see that these uh, two young twin who took us on a journey to their houses uh, when they were young, they still have to stand up and speak uh, for that uh, even after all these years and who knows how the situation will actually end. <clears throat> and this is a photo of them after uh, being released, after uh, being arrested and um, detained by Israeli authorities just last week. And as I said, um, the videos reflect uh, people's um, stories and um, there is a power in sitting there and seeing, uh, for example, a boy telling you how he felt after um, his, uh, uh, his cousins got, uh, <coughs> got killed in front of his own eyes while they were playing football on the beach in Gaza. So um, at the same time, inside that virtual environment, you're being trapped inside um, a checkpoint. And uh, that's um, another example from the virtual environment. And um, that's the end of the uh, Yaffa scene. <clears throat> and that's another one in Jerusalem.
So what did I learn from the process of creating and testing uh, this prototype? Uh, and uh, what are the potentials of using game engines in activist spatial experiences? Well, firstly, um, because I've talked about how, uh, like the idea of wanting to work with low cost technology and um, gaming technology in general um, uh, uh, can be considered affordable. So for example, Unity uh, offered a free personal license under, under certain uh, conditions. And usually these conditions, uh, like in my case at that time, would uh, fit with uh, you know, working on an activist project where you're not actually making any money out of it. Uh, but also uh, game engines um, can help us create virtual environments that facilitate that spatial and experiential interaction. So if we want to try and mimic, you know, being uh, confined in a space or having this kind of restriction of movement is, is quite uh, doable and interesting to do in, in game engines. And in fact, um, one of the uh, the participants who came and saw my prototype talked to me uh, or actually reflected about how he thought the subversion of, um, you know, the, like the established paradigm of, of gaming is actually freedom of movement. You can jump almost everywhere, look in all directions, move at different speeds. But what I was actually forcing the viewers to do in my experience is quite the opposite. It's restricting their movement and not allowing them to go any further or to jump there or to go from one point to another. So that subversion um, added to the whole uh, experience of, you know, how can we, uh, how can we sit on, uh, like to, to help the viewers feel so uncomfortable by being, you know, deprived from their right and their, and their freedom to, to movement. And um, also using game engines, as, as I said, I wasn't a game developer. And um, so there has there is a lot of documentation and support online that um, people working in activist projects could uh, tap on and uh, be able to use uh, to their own benefits. And um, also we can use a lot of existing assets that you find uh, online. And um, usually uh, you have a lot of uh, free assets that you can uh, use and work with. So again, all of these are um, important points that um, uh, people can um, uh, make use of when they are creating activist spatial experiences. Okay. And uh, lastly, there is a lot of uh, flexibility and adaptability in uh, output opportunities. So as I said, uh, they could be done on uh, like desktop screens, they could be done as projection on uh, in, in various uh, indoor and outdoor spaces. They could be even, you know, presented in head mount devices on mobile devices. So um, this play with uh, different output opportunities could be also a great asset to any activist project. But at the same time, there is a few limitations of using game engines in such uh, experiences. Uh, the main thing is how to balance uh, the gaming technology and any gaming characteristics with the sensitivity of the subject that is being uh, presented. So it's really important to uh, be mindful not to trivialize, trivialize the subject matter and to have that uh, sensitivity toward the subject that is, in, is being presented. And as I said, um, um, there is um, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of, um, you know, like people would be drawn to the technology itself. So it's really important to make sure that the focus stays on the subject matter rather than, you know, being drawn by the beauty or the advancement of the technology that is being used, especially when uh, such experiences could be, you know, put in public spaces where people from different backgrounds and different technological knowledge might come and interact with the work. Wow. And the other thing is um, creating a balance of the enjoyment part. So definitely when there is, when we're talking about interactive media or digital media or gaming uh, technologies, uh, the issue of playfulness and enjoyment is there, especially with anything that is in interactive. So it's really important to, uh, we can't totally ignore uh, that part, but to actually use that part, you know, as, 
uh, as a drawing point and people, you know, just um, uh, engaging their curiosity uh, and then from there start, you know, um, presenting a more uh, difficult subject. So it could be a way to ease the experience, uh, the, the viewers into, into the experience. And um, in my case, uh, we also need to be mindful of technical limitations and difficulties in user experiences. So for example, um, using the leap motion controller wasn't as, um, as friendly as I would hoped it to be. Uh, so whatever technology that we're using, we need to also um, understand um, user experience. And again, because we are presenting it to a wider audience with very uh, varying um, knowledge of technology, uh, it could be a hindrance in some cases for people to actually interact or uh, be in, uh, engaged with the work presented to them. <clears throat> So to conclude, um, using interactive digital media and in particular game engines um, definitely can provide new venues uh, for virtual museum like politically driven experiences and hopefully what these activists spatial experiences will do is push the boundaries of not only who gets to talk, but also who gets to be heard. And <sighs> That's the end of my presentation for today. I hope I wasn't too long for you. So if you have any comments or questions, and if you want to contact me, here's my contacts there. I, I would love to hear from you. And I'll, I'll just <clears throat> stop this. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try and see if there is any questions. <clears throat> I'm trying to see if there is any questions, sorry. Question. Okay, so Helen uh, asks, will you keep developing the project? Where and how do you see Rivers of Palestine being showcased to the public in the future? Um, yes, I have um, the intention and I've started developing the project further. Of course, um, when you, like when you want to open it up for a wider audience, like um, there's a lot of other considerations that working at the safety of um, the academic institution you don't think of. Um, I'm hoping to actually see it in some uh, art, um, like in some art uh, galleries uh, in Australia. I think uh, it would be quite interesting to see if there is an interest in that. Uh, in the future, I would love to see snippets of it. I don't think the whole experience could be exhibited, but also in, in public spaces. Um, like at some point I thought about, you know, uh, train stations, not sure if that works here in, in Melbourne, but, you know, um, seeing bits and pieces of, of the experience. Um, and um, I think that in, in that case, like the interaction would change from what it is because um, having it as a, um, an experience led by one person is definitely different than having it, you know, running by itself while people are walking by or, uh, you know, uh, the number of the audience definitely uh, changes the interaction. But what is quite important, I, want, I just want to say that that interaction should be served in a thematic way. So uh, whatever kind of interaction someone is creating in that experience should feed into the theme of that um, experience. How do you deal with the intense emotions that you might feel working on a project on a subject matter? This it's um <clears throat> that's a really tough question helen um i think it's um 
in in some cases the, those intense emotions are your drive so when you're talking about something that is part of your identity and it's part of your history if it reflects you know your um, your your parents or uh, your grandparents stories then you feel um you feel that inside of you, like there is this drive that you want to do justice and you want to make sure that these stories and these um, narratives are being uh, uh, presented correctly and uh, to, to the people. But at the same time, um, like for example, in during my PhD, the um, 2000, um, was it 2014? Uh, yeah, I think 2014 aggression on Gaza happened. And at that time, that was really difficult for me to work or read or engage uh, in this beyond, you know, like you're seeing people being bombed and um, um, it, it's quite difficult. So sometimes taking time off out or having a support um, system around you that could uh, offer you, you know, the, the space that you need to uh, internalize all of these uh, horrors that are unfolding in front of you. But as I said, um, at the end, you try and turn that into the drive that would keep you going. Uh, Duncan, did you experiment with any other control inputs beside the leap motion? Did you gain any insights? of how you might approach input in the future. Uh, yes, um, uh, I've actually at the beginning, um, I've, I've only looked at, um, like I've only, I haven't actually tested any of the technology, but I've been looking around for uh, technologies uh, or uh, gaming uh, controllers. So, um, I I were uh, I tried the Kinect I think it is called, um, um, and then uh, because I wanted something that would allow more people in the space, but actually take the input from one person, and that's why I ended up using Leap. Um, and as I said, the, the reason why I decided to work on Leap is just because it doesn't look like a controller. But if any of you have ever worked with Leap Motion, you know that usually. What it does, it, it reads the hand movement and it, it translates it into a virtual hand. So it is basically more used, you know, in grabbing stuff and moving stuff and that kind of thing. But what I've done is used hand gestures to actually translate into movement, um, uh, into movement in the real environment. So, for example, to move forward, you had to do this to look to this side, to this side, and then to walk back. So it wasn't. Um, well, I think it it wasn't as intuitive as I thought it would be because when you work sometimes with something for so long, you get used to it. And even when I was testing the code, I think it was reading, um, it was responding well to the speed and to the way that I'm moving my hand. But then when other people came, it didn't um, always work as, as, as smoothly as I wanted it to be. So there were a lot of instances where people felt that they were stuck. Now, feeling stuck um, fed into my experience, but at the same time, uh, it's really important to, again, find the balance of for, for people to understand whether this is part of your experience or whether, or whether this is just bad user experience, you know, and for them to just, you know, end it and say, ah, oh, enough, it's too difficult, I don't want to do it. So <clears throat> I think um, balancing that uh, and actually using it in the correct way is, um, is something that, yeah, needs to be uh, further investigated and considered. Uh, would I uh, stick to leap motion? I'm not sure. Uh, I think that I might try other ways of interaction. As I said, it was um, it's it served um, in in many instances. It did what I wanted it to do, but at the same time, I think that um, user experience needs to be uh, worked on more. If we, especially if we're opening it up to a wider audience who have, uh, as I said, various uh, technology uh, literacy. Chad, um, I often feel with activist projects, it is hard to penetrate beyond those who uh, are already on board preaching to the choir. Is there a way to break through to those that need to see the work? Um, that's a very interesting uh, point, uh, Chad. And um, yeah, um, I think somebody 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think somebody else told me that once that uh, are you preaching to the already converted? So I think um, in general, um, if you want to speak to the wider audience that then you 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 need to occupy to occupy their spaces and um that's why um i was thinking about you know uh public intervention in urban spaces because then people see it in front of them and the same goes to i think some art galleries where you know you have a various um, people coming over and, and, and seeing your work. So um, uh, it is true that it is hard to penetrate, but, um, and I think that I felt that like in my um, testing, when I've done the testing, most of the people, most of the people uh, agreed with what they were saying, uh, seeing, sorry, but there were a few that were skeptic about, you know, you would hear the usual, well, there's two sides to the story and you're not bringing the other voice and, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I agree with you. And I feel that maybe a starting point would be to, yeah, occupy different spaces where usually people not necessarily might want to listen to actually listen, being forced to listen. Uh, Eugenia is asking, have you thought about doing workshops with other people like young people and or, or other activists? It's not just an amazing game or to also an important tool. Um, do you mean like young people and activists in this particular uh, in, in the, on this particular situation or in general? I'm not sure. Uh, but um, yeah, that's I think that's a good idea to engage with existing um, activist circles here in Australia and solidarity groups here. Um, as I said, most of the videos that I've used uh, in the presentation is actually done by activists and or, or normal people working on the ground in Palestine. So there has been a lot of um, videos, for example, by um, yeah, by various groups that are working uh, on the ground there. Uh, yes, uh, okay. Mohammed Shamus is asking, um, could Revisit Palestine make use of virtual reality? Why or why not? Yes, it could. Um, and um, I think um, I didn't try that because of uh, my uh, limited knowledge of that technology, but it is something again that I think uh, can be uh, added into this uh, type of work. Um, and um, again, like that would require a larger team, uh, a little bit more funding to uh, expand and work on this. But uh, definitely it can be done as a virtual reality project. And um, um, if I'm using head mounted displays, um, or, like I'm mindful of actually using the ones that are on the more affordable scale because some of those uh, devices are quite expensive and that's not something that um, I would like. Um, but at the same time, um, I think there is um, a beauty in um, having to experience that uh, with other people, um, like with other people. So uh, in a group and like to have that, um, sense of you're not alone in this experience, that there are other people and you are all experiencing it together. I think it's a different, uh, it gives a different feeling. Having said that, one of uh, the potentials that I've discussed of using game technology is actually the ability to um, have different you know, outputs and uh, definitely virtual reality is one of them and having it as a one-to-one -one experience rather than as a um, spatial experience projected in a space. Thank you, Mohammed, for your nice words. Thank you. 
train stations you were talking about. Yes, Eugenia. Yep, thank you. Yep, um, and uh, you've um, you've said both. So I'm assuming that you said, have you thought about doing workshops with other people? Definitely, I think that um, this kind of activist spatial experiences can be applied to so many different kind of, like, so the, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are being silenced or ignored or, you know, um, misrepresented. So in Australia, you have so many causes and so many uh, things that you, we, we can work with. So, um, you know, death in custody, the Aboriginal uh, rights and all of that things that there are quite important asylum seekers, um, you know, detention centers. We have so many, uh, unfortunately, so many injustices happening uh, here that we could work with but uh, also on a global scale there are so many you know political situations the things that are happening in Syria in Yemen uh, to the Uyghur in China you know um, Black Lives Matters and all of those uh, political situations but then you have other things like um, it doesn't necessarily the activism has to be political you have environmental issues and you have social issues so uh, talking about domestic violence and and, you know, all of uh, those quite important subjects that are usually, as I said, either ignored, contested, neglected. Uh, so definitely this could be um, um, a prototype for other uh, activities to happen. So definitely it is something that I would like to work with on different um, subjects and not just the Palestinian situation. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I think I've, I've been talking a lot. It's uh, it's almost one hour. So, Chad, I'll leave that to you. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>